Our subject this evening is a forgotten command. It's really not probably literally a forgotten command, maybe more a neglected command, maybe one that we don't see the importance of, maybe a command that we think, well, it, it would probably be a good idea if we did that, but we don't really make it a priority. And so uh, probably not a big mystery what that command is after Mitch has done such a good job of uh, leading songs tonight, you probably can guess it. But let's go ahead and look at some of the benefits of this command. Number one, it prevents sin. It's huge in this regard. It improves worship, not just on Sunday, but daily, daily worship. Maintains a spiritual perspective. You know, in the adult Bible class in auditorium, we've been studying Ecclesiastes. Solomon talking about life under the sun, and we've talked about the, the carnal perspective versus the spiritual perspective and how important it is for us to keep a spiritual perspective. And this will help us keep a spiritual perspective. Increases happiness and contentment. Who doesn't want to be happy and content? Improves relationship with God, spouse, and others. Increases our spiritual maturity. So I hope you're thinking right now, you mean one thing can get me all these benefits? And the answer is yes. Yes, it can. And that's what I hope to show you tonight. So we're going to reveal what this is. But before we do, you're probably going to roll your eyes when you see it. And you're probably not going to believe that it can really do all these things. So that's okay. I'm prepared for that. Thankfulness. I know you're probably underwhelmed and you're probably wondering how can it really do all those things. But I think if you'll give me just a few minutes, I can show you. And I think we'll all be benefited by being here tonight. I know it's benefited me. First of all, let's establish that it is commanded. Ephesians 5 giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's mentioned over a hundred times in the Bible. I, we could have put four or five slides full of verses commanding thankfulness. I, I chose these two in particular because we're going to come back to them later on. So remember these two verses. We're going to refer back to them later on in the sermon. So why is thankfulness commanded? All these benefits that I showed you. We're going to go through each one of these one at a time. And, and we're going to look at how and why thankfulness is commanded and how it accomplishes all these things. First of all, it helps prevent sin. You know, the, the Israelites, they were in captivity in Egypt and when Moses led them out, they saw miracles on the grandest scale more than anyone had ever seen. They witnessed the 10 plagues. The 10 plagues, the Nile River turned into blood. You know, I won't go through all the 10 plagues, but it's just amazing the plagues that, the, that they witnessed. Then Moses leads them out. God parts the Red Sea. Okay, it's, it's 230 foot deep. It's 12 miles across, like from here to downtown Tyler. They crossed on dry ground. Here comes the Egyptian army chasing them. And, and, of course, I'm sure they're panicking. And then what happens? God closes the sea back up, destroys the Egyptian army. I mean, amazing they could witness these miracles. And then a few days later, what are they doing? Grumbling and complaining. Were they thankful for all these things God had done for them? No. All throughout their, their trek in the wilderness across to the promised land, they're going to a promised land that God promised them, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And they'd seen these great miracles. And all they did was grumble and complain. They saw Moses get the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. They, They saw God provide manna, quail, water for them. All these miracles. Yet, they would forget all these things. And they would grumble, their lack of faith. Of all those over a million people, only two of them were able to see the promised land. Because of this. Lack of thankfulness. They were not thankful. In Romans chapter 1, turn to Romans chapter 1, please, in in your Bible. Uh, I want to start over at the end. It's talking about some really bad people here at the end of Romans 1. Starting in verse 28, let's read there. These are some bad folks. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They're whispers, backbiters, haters of God. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Horrible people. But where did their downhill slide start? Let's go back to verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and they went downhill from there. It all started, didn't acknowledge God, weren't thankful to God. That's where it started. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. We all know the story of Adam and Eve. Even the little children know the story of Adam and Eve, I'm sure. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 5. This is Satan talking to Eve. He says, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So here she was living in the Garden of Eden, had everything. God had set them up. They were in paradise. They had one job. Don't eat of this tree. That's it. Satan comes along and tells her, you can be like God if you do this. She wanted something she didn't have. It's a thing, it's hardwired into us humans, isn't it? Wanting things we don't have. She was not thankful. She was not content. She wanted what she didn't have. Caused her to sin. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Look at King David. Lots of good lessons we can learn from King David. Second Samuel chapter 12. Now remember, David was a man after God's own heart. God had helped him, had been with him since he was a youth when he killed Goliath. And then... He helped, he's helped him. God has been with him his whole life. Saul was chasing him all over, trying to kill him. God saved him every time. God had always been with David. And then, once David become king, becomes king, we know what happens. He sins. He takes another man's wife and then murders a man. We all know that. But here... In chapter 12, verse 7, Nathan, God's prophet, confronts David. And Nathan says to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. I gave you all these things. He was the richest, most powerful man on the earth at that time. No army could stand up to them. They defeated everyone. He had everything he wanted. And God said, if that wasn't enough, 
I could have given you more. He wasn't thankful. Didn't appreciate it. So he wants something he doesn't have. Same thing that happened to Eve. And it all starts back because they're not thankful. So I think you can see this is a huge, thankfulness is a huge sin preventer. Huge sin preventer. Okay, the next one we said it would improve our worship. God is magnified with thanksgiving. He's glorified when thanksgiving abounds. He's praised by giving thanks to his name. You know, Jonathan talked a lot about these things this morning and, and it, it would seem like he and I put our heads together and I would like to tell you that we plan these sermons to, to go together and coordinate like this, but we're not that smart. It's just dumb luck. But, but it really... It really, Jonathan did a great job of, of talking about these things this morning. But how do we magnify, glorify, praise God? By thanking him, giving him thanksgiving. And I thought he did a great job of that. And we got a lot of comments from, from a lot of the members about uh, how meaningful the Lord's Supper was this morning after that lesson. Why? Because it made us all more aware to be more thankful for everything God has done for us. So it's going to improve our worship, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. We need to be thankful to God. We can magnify, glorify, praise him every day of the week by giving him thanksgiving, being thankful to him. Also, and this goes along with that, It helps us to maintain a spiritual perspective. We thank God every day in our prayers. It's an acknowledgement and a reminder of his greatness and power. Every day when you go outside, do you notice the beauty and wonder of his creation? If not, you should. It's a reminder of God's greatness and his power. Every day, do you thank God for what he has done? for what he is doing, for what he will do. I hope you do because we humans, we're forgetful. It's like Peter said over and over, I know you know this stuff, but I'm reminding you. I know you know this, but you need to be reminded. We have to be reminded. Humans do. We need to remind ourselves every day by thanking God for all these things. What about our dependence and reliance on him? Every single one of us is totally dependent on God's grace and mercy. Every one of us. We need to be thanking him for that every single day. Every single day. And when you do that, like Jonathan pointed out today, that's going to keep your battery charged, isn't it? When you do that every single day. That's the goal. And doing these things keeps our perspective right. It keeps us from getting caught up in this life under the sun, doesn't it? it? Keeps our perspective where it should be. The next one. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. It increases happiness and contentment. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. If Philippians 4, we're going to start reading in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul gives us the recipe for happiness and contentment right here. He said, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that we can't even comprehend is going to guard our hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. That's it. That's happiness and contentment right there. Praying to God with thanksgiving. Lay it on him. Let's continue on in verse 8. 
how to improve our relationship with God, our spouse, and others. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So we've already talked really in the last slide about how to improve our relationship with God by thanking him every day for everything he's done for us. So what about when it comes to our spouse? Do we thank God every day for our spouse? Are we thankful to our spouse? So what do we meditate on? We choose what we meditate on. How do we look at our spouse? If we, if we thank God every day for our spouse and we meditate on the good things like Paul's talking about here, the things of good report, the lovely things, all the positive qualities, then how are you going to treat your spouse? What about the flip side? What if you notice the bad things about your spouse? And what if you dwell on all your spouse's mistakes and their little habits that, that drive you nuts? And you, you dwell on that all the time, it becomes like a cancer, doesn't it? We've all done that. And so now you have a bad attitude, and now how do you treat them? See how that works? But like Paul says here, meditate on the good things, the pure things, the lovely things, the things of good report, the things of virtue, the things that are praiseworthy. That's what you meditate on. And all of this being thankful. It's going to improve your relationship with your spouse, and it goes for your relationship with anyone, your coworkers, other Christians, whoever. You control what you meditate on. Okay, look at what we've covered so far. We've covered almost all of them. There's one more down at the bottom that we haven't covered yet, and that's increase in spiritual maturity. That's the big one. So we're going to spend a little more time on that one. So the way we're going to increase in spiritual maturity is by maturing in thankfulness. So we're talking about maturing. Maturing is a process, isn't it? It doesn't just happen. You know, you don't go from being a kid to being an adult, you know, like that. It, it's a long process. Maturing in thankfulness is no different either. It's a process. It starts with the basics being thankful for the blessings of God. Very basic. Our, the, our little children know how to do that. Grandchildren, they know how to be thankful. My youngest granddaughter, little June, spent a couple of days at my house last week. And every time we sat down to eat, Pop, don't forget to say the prayer. She knew. She knew that we needed to be thankful to God for our food. That's stage one. Now, stage two is overcoming our desires for things we don't have. Things like affected Eve and David. You, you got to be a little more mature to get to there. While June was at our house, she uh, came up to me one day. She said, Pops, do you have $163? I said, Yeah. She said, okay. She pulled out this paper. She had a list of things on there. She said, I made a list of all these things I want. And I got on the iPad. I looked up all the prices that I wrote them out here. And then I added them all up. And it comes up to $163. And she said, so can I have it? And you know, in her naive little mind, she's thinking, this is Pops. He loves me. He has $163. That's just how much I need to buy the stuff I want. So he, he'll just give me that and I'll be happy. You know, she had it all figured out. And, and I, I tried to reason with her a little bit. I said, you know, honey, you can't always get what you want. You know, and, and I tried to get her the counter blessings a little bit, but she wasn't buying it. She wasn't buying it. She ordered that stuff. The reason is because she's not mature enough to understand this yet. You know, hopefully we, we mature as time goes on. June, don't feel bad though. There's a lot of grown-ups that haven't matured past this point either. 
So don't feel bad. I do like her attitude though. She stayed down in the dumps for about two minutes. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you could see a light come on and she popped up and she ran in there with her grandmother. And the next thing I knew, she was washing dishes and she was folding clothes and she was cleaning up. She was going to earn the money. So I like her attitude. Anyway, as we grow in maturity and we grow, we get to the next level. And this is the goal. We want to view everyday life through the lens of thankfulness. That's what we want to do. Every day, everyday life, we want to view it through the lens of thankfulness, thankfulness to God, thankfulness to our spouse or our coworkers or whoever we're with. And, and that's the goal. But that's not the last one. There's one more. One more level I hadn't showed you yet. Remember those two verses I told you we're going to come back to? These two verses here? Let's look on the, on the yellow part here. The first one, always giving thanks always and for everything. And giving thanks in all circumstances. So what does all and everything mean? What, what about when life goes sideways? What about when things are tough? What about when I'm going through difficult times? Am I supposed to be thankful then too? Well, we got to be willing not only to accept, but to be thankful for trials and challenges that produce growth. We have to learn to trust that God is working for our good and for our growth, especially in times of trial, especially. I mean, otherwise, would we have it where we want to have this good, thankful, spiritual perspective when life is good and things are going good, but when things go bad, all of a sudden I'm going to get carnal? have a carnal perspective and start feeling sorry for myself and forget about God? Is that the way it works? No. We know better than that. Most of you can probably guess what our last few verses are. Turn to James chapter 1, or you can read it here. Verses 2 through 5. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let's look at this a little closer. He says... Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Okay, when you encounter something, that means you're just getting there, right? You're not in it yet, you're just getting there. So how do you consider it joy when you're first getting there? The implication is you have to have your mind already made up ahead of time, don't you? Also, look where he says uh, in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You already know that ahead of time. Because you've already made your mind up how you're going to react. Okay? You've already made your mind up. It's just like, uh, you know, Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart before he was tempted. In the Old Testament, God's people prepared their heart to serve God. It's all done ahead of time. You know, like I, I think I said this a couple of weeks ago when I, in our Bible class. We teach our teenagers, hey, when, when you find yourself at a party somewhere and all of a sudden they pull out alcohol or weed or something like that, if you wait until then to make your decision of whether or not you're going to do it, you're going to always fail. What do you have to do? You have to make your mind up ahead of time before the temptation ever comes up. Make your mind up how you're going to react. No different for mature Christians. When, when trials and struggles come up, 
And by the way, what's he, what's he talking about trials here? These trials, this, this could be persecution. It could be temptation by Satan. It could be testing coming from God. It could just be struggles and difficulties of life. Any tough times that you go through. It doesn't matter what the source of the trial is. But God wants us to handle all of them the same way. So we need to have our minds set ahead of time how we're going to handle them. The testing of your faith produces endurance. You know, we just started uh, last Monday, the high school boys started two a days in football. And of course, it's the hottest week of the year when they started. You know, we, we've got some boys in here, Ryder and, and, and Hayden and my two grandsons, Jonah and Isaac. They're, they're doing that right now. And it's hot and they're out there with those pads on and people say, how can they do that? Man, you know, how do they stand it? But you know what? They stand it because they know this testing is going to produce endurance. They know that they're going to go out there. They know it's going to be hard. They know they're going to get beat up. They know they're going to get bruised. They're going to get battered. It's going to be hard. They're going to be tired. It's going to be real hard. But they know they're going to come out of it mentally tougher and physically tougher. And they know that the boys over in Van and Henderson and Kilgore, they're all practicing too. And, and they know that they got to they gotta practice harder than them if they expect to beat them. And they know that down in the future, there's going to come some nice, cool fall Friday nights when they're going to be playing those games. They can see all that in the future. But they know this testing right now produces that endurance. It's no different for us as Christians. We know when we're going to go through trials, we need, James wants us to know ahead of time. Yeah, it's going to be tough, but you need to begin with the end in mind. Think about the end. Knowing that the testing of your faith is going to produce endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's like a chain here. It starts off, you encounter a trial, you know that the testing of your faith is going to pr produce endurance and the endurance is going to have the result that you're going to be perfect and complete. It says you've got to see that before you ever start. Now you might wonder why I put verse 5 over here on this. But if any of you lacks wisdom, what has wisdom got to do with this? Well, if you don't see this, if you're not mature enough to see how, that the, the testing of your faith produces endurance and it makes you stronger, if you don't see that, then you don't have wisdom. And so he says, that's why this verse is immediately after that. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach that, that it will be given to him. So if you're not yet spiritually mature, that you can't see this, if you can't handle this yet, pray to God. Ask for wisdom. That's how you get through it. One, one verse that always has been a comfort to me, and I know it has to a lot of people, is Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God. You may not see it now. You sure don't see it when you're going through the, the, the trial and the tough time. You may not see it a year later. You may not see it five years later. It may take 10 years later. But I've had so many people tell me these things that I went through way back a long time ago, it was so hard. I didn't know how I was going to get through it. But now that I look back, I can see how it benefited me. I can see the good that came out of it. And they could actually be thankful for horrible things that happened to them a long, long time ago. That's how we grow. We have to trust that God is working for good in our lives. We need to keep trusting him. And keep being thankful to him. We have to always see the big picture. Try to keep the spiritual perspective in mind. 
You know, that's my lesson. I hope, I hope you can see, I hope you can see how powerful it is to have a thankful heart and the power that's in that and how much it can help each one of us. Let me tell you this from, from personal experience. This might sound kind of trite, but, but I worked on this lesson and so I've been trying to do this. I've tried to do this. And you know what I notice when I, the, the more I can do this and incorporate thankfulness in my life, the, the, the more I do it, it's like the sky is bluer. My food tastes better. My wife's prettier. I can hear the birds singing. You know, it's like your whole life is better. That shouldn't be a surprise, though. God, why does God command this? For our good. For us. He wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be happy. He doesn't need our thankfulness. It's like every other command. It's for our benefit. So remember that. And remember this. In every circumstance of life, I can respond in one of two ways. I can either whine and complain, or I can be thankful. But I make the choice. I make the choice. I choose how I'm going to respond. Thank you for your attention. We never want to conclude a service without giving someone an opportunity to respond to the gospel. So if anyone would like to be baptized for the remission of their sins, or if anyone needs the prayers of the congregation, or if there's anything else we can do for you to help you in any way, please come forward now while together we stand and sing.